everyone, I'm Corinne. And I'm Brandy. Welcome to A Pot of Tales, the podcast where we read you short stories we made up and now you have to listen to. And every week we will each present a short story using the same genre, setting, and a challenge item to include. Everything else is up to our own interpretation. I would just like to say real quick, um, sorry that we skipped last week. Yeah. I've had a lot going on in my personal life, and I know Brandy has too, mm-hmm. but I did just get a new job. So I had to spend a lot of time doing homework for it because it's at a preschool and I'm not certified in anything. So I had to go ahead and take some online classes and stuff like that. So there was no time for me to do anything else really, but that's fine because it'll be fun. It's going to be a fun new adventure for me. That's exciting. Yeah. So how was your Thanksgiving? It was good. Um, We went to Brandon's grandparents' house and we ate lots of food. And I died. You died? Yeah. From a food coma. Oh, I was like, explain. (laughs) Yeah, food coma. Oh. I went to Ryan's lovely aunt's house, his aunt Missy, and his whole family was over there. All of his mother's sisters and all of their children and his grandparents. And then we went over to mom's house. Oh, how was that? It was good. Good. And we brought Grammy home. She needed a ride home. Yeah. (laughs) I know she stayed the night. At mom's the day before, right? Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so we took her home that night, too, so that way she didn't have to wake up at 3 a.m. to go shopping with mom Black Friday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I stayed home. I I just stayed on my laptop and shopped. What did I even do Friday? Oh, I think I, like, tried to do some of my courses on Friday, but I had to hunt down... What did I... Oh, my God, what did I do? <laughs> I had to leave because I needed to oh yeah I needed to get new pants for my new job because we have to wear black pants and or Ooh, khakis well, or khakis oh. and I'm not wearing khakis that, that will not look good on me I'm what too khakis? pale I'm too pale get for black khakis. khakis what? Get black khakis. Get black khakis? Yeah, they have all different types of colors. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I think khakis and I think Jake from State Farm, so... That's all right. Not an ad. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I got these I got these nice black... Um, they're kind of stretchy jeans. Oh, I have those. Yeah, and they hug my belly because they're high-rise. <laughs> Ooh. But yeah, they let us wear blue jeans on Friday, and I was like, ooh, they're relaxing casual Fridays means you get to wear jeans that's my every day I know well I'm going from wearing leggings every day to having to wear jeans every oh, day yeah. I don't <laughs> think I've seen you in a pair of jeans in forever I'm wearing some right now these are my work pants oh, I thought, I thought I'd break leggings them in. no well I thought I'd break them in to see if um see if I needed a belt or not mm. which so far I think they're okay because they're high rise again so I don't know how they'll get, though, if I have to, like, get on the floor a lot with the kids or whatever. Do some squats in them. Yeah, that's a good idea. They are stretchy, so I yeah. probably could. But do they look like jeans, though? Like, now that you're looking at them? Like yeah. They, like, yeah, they, they do. Pockets. Okay. Because they, they said no leggings, even though they're not leggings. No, they, they do look like jeans. I just am used to seeing black on your legs, so <laughs> I didn't really just... It didn't really register. Yeah, I like these. I found them at Walmart, mm. and they were pretty cheap. But, like, not too cheap, where they're going to, like, fall apart easily. How much are they? I need more. Like, $14 Ooh. for pants. For, like, pants, those are... I think that's a good deal. Yeah. Yeah. But you got it on Black Friday, though, right? Yeah, but they weren't, like, on sale. Oh, they okay. were already at, like, Walmart price. Oh, okay, cool. And while I was there, I did find one small thing for Ryan. I'm not telling you what it is. Oh, though, but, I want to know. Even though I don't know if he listens yet, but... <laughs> wow, he doesn't listen? Oh, he said he has. I just don't know if he listens consistently, and that's okay, because we've both been busy. But I know Brandon's our number one fan, but yeah. that brings me to my segue, <laughs> which is why I brought him up. Oh, yeah. Um, so, to everyone, our first listener episode will be released on December 25th, which is also Christmas. We chose that date because it's Christmas. <laughs> but so from then on, after Christmas, not January 1st though, 
We are going to be doing a listener episode monthly on the 1st, so that way everyone can remember to tune in first of every month. Mm. So if you have a short story that you have written or want to write, it can be anything you want. Um, like, you know, as long as it's appropriate to, like, read on the air. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it could be anything you want. It could be your own ideas. Or if you need some inspiration, you can use any of our prompts that we have used in the past. Um, I think they're a lot of fun, some of them. And we have gotten a couple. And I'm excited to read them. One of them did use one of our prompts, and I'm very excited. They asked to specifically stay anonymous, so mm -hmm. I will respect their wishes. And we will have a special guest on that listener episode on Christmas. Brandy, would you like to tell them who it is? It is my husband, Brandon Cora. Yes. Yes, so he'll, he will be on here reading an excerpt from a book that he is writing. Yeah. And we're very excited to have him on here for it. And possibly one other story for you. We'll see if... <laughs> we didn't give her much time to write it, so... Um, oh, she'll write it. Oh, she'll write it. Michaela, we're putting it out there. Yeah. So now everyone's looking forward to it. No pressure. I will you. read it for <laughs> you. You don't have to be here if you don't want to. Okay. Oh, and also, if you have any ideas for us to do for our regular episodes, um, like prompts, like if you have a cool combination of a genre and a setting and a challenge that you would like to see us try to write a story for... Um, feel free to send them in and you can send both the short stories and your ideas to a pod of tales at gmail.com just put in the subject line which one you're writing in for so that way we can organize them and know which ones are which yes also I went to TSO I'm not forgetting that because it was so fun sorry I forgot to ask you about that how dare you <laughs> well Oh, yeah, I guess I did kind of segue a little early. But that's okay. How was it? It was amazing. May well, I just say snow globe. Snow globe? Snow globe. Did they, like, rain snow down on you guys? No. Oh. But I don't want to ruin it yet, so... Because they're still on tour. But fun fact, um, this is my third time going there. And the first time I ever went there was on... The day that Brandon proposed to me. Uh, I was going to ask you if it was last year or the year before, because time to me doesn't exist. And for some reason, it feels like that was just last year. 2021. Oh, okay. That's so nice. Yeah. So now it's a yearly tradition that we go. Thanks for the invite. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't invite me. You can go next year. Mom might go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, me and Ryan were talking about it because we couldn't remember if they had already come or not because they usually come in November and we're like oh we'll check it next year and then I saw like literally the day after you guys were like going and I was like oh yeah it's <laughs> usually like right after Thanksgiving like the weekend of or like I don't know close to Thanksgiving yeah, cool. yeah. it's usually right after it so oh, okay good to know keep that in mind for next year and I get a t-shirt every year. I notice you're wearing it right now. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. That's good. I'm glad you guys had fun. Mm -hmm. We we used to go, me and Ryan, we went a couple times, like, pre-COVID, so this was a while ago. And I think we went two years in a row, and we were trying to make it a tradition, and we would wear an ugly sweater there. Mm -hmm. And we only did it twice, and then kind of lost track of them after that. <laughs> so then we didn't go back again, and covid shut everything down and i was like well i guess we'll never go to concerts again oh well that's because i thought that everything was kind of going to be terrible from here on out so yeah that's true yeah that's true but there's six of us that go so if you want to make yourselves seven and eight <laughs> oh thanks yeah we'll see we'll see i can't plan ahead a whole year unfortunately but we'll see i think it's time for our stories so this week's categories are horror, and then... <laughs> <laughs> I just love hearing people try to say horror. Horror? Horror? Horror. 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 <laughs> At a mental hospital, and the challenge item was a car. Mm-hmm. 
that was not difficult. But I will say, it was kind of a bummer. As much as Why? I love, as much as I love, like the like, cause I love you know me. I love watching all the ghost hunting shows. Those are always the best episodes, but it's always for the worst reasons. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, because of that, I have written a pretty depressing horror story. Oh, man. So, well, I took a bunch of notes, because I was, like, trying to think... I was trying to think specifically of all the old mental hospitals that I know of from all the ghost hunting shows and what made them so terrible and horrifying. And one of the more famous ones is the Penhurst Asylum in Pennsylvania. You ever heard oh, of that? yeah. Yeah, they nicknamed it the Shame of Pennsylvania. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was started in 1908, and it was pretty bad. The conditions were so bad that um, I took a lot of notes on it because I rewatched the episode of Project Fear on it. Mm. <laughs> so I want to give them credit for giving me some ideas. Because that's, if you haven't seen them on YouTube, they are a fantastic ghost hunting show there. Like, they're, they take it seriously when they need to, but they're also a little silly, so it's yeah. more lighthearted content for it. But they're respectfully silly, I should say. Respectfully silly. Yeah, so the Penhurst Asylum, I kind of based my mental hospital, my fictional one, off of it. And, like, a couple other asylums I just remembered random facts of here and there as I was writing. So, like, like I said... It was found in 1908. It was pretty terrible to people with developmental and intellectual... Oh, my God. In, intellectual. intellectual disabilities. Yes, thank you. So, regardless of their age, the patients were called inmates or children. It was only built to house up to 500 people at a time, but quickly filled to 2,800. Oh, my God. Overworked staff quickly turned it to violence when dealing with patients... Patients who died while there were buried on the property in mass graves. Mm. A lot of them unmarked. Because they're mass graves. <laughs> <laughs> in 1968, a TV reporter named Bill Bal Baldini, I forget how he said that, um, exposed the cruel conditions in a televised report called Suffer the Little Children. There were up to 80 people in one room, and the smell and cries were unbearable. People who couldn't walk were kept in cribs all day and night, including fully grown adults. And their muscles were basically like, what's the word for it, when they like disappear? Atrophied? Yes, atrophied. So they couldn't even walk even if they wanted to. Oh, jeez. Uh, like they, there weren't enough people there to teach them how to crawl to be able to have like the ability to walk. Oh, this was... Oh, so the people that were in the cribs were also chained to the cribs. And they call them cribs and cages. So I can't imagine that, like, what kind of cages they were. Mm. But they call them cribs and cages. Oh, this part is pretty messed up. Remember, people, this, is, this actually happened. Not just this place, but other um, unsupervised, quote-unquote, like, mental hospitals that were supposed to be helping people. They were pretty bad. So the patients that would bite the employees would have all of their teeth painfully removed. And there was a doctor there uh, named Dr. Jesse G. Fear. They kept saying fear, which I was like, that's way too on the nose. Um, so I don't know. I should have probably looked up like a written report about it, but it sounded like they called him fear. But he used painful yet harmless injections to punish and intimidate patients at will. It's unclear how many died here, but the number is estimated to be in the thousands. So, clearly, this is a very haunted asylum. <laughs> so, so it just... was it like that, like, everywhere that they went? Like, is that just how the mental hospitals were treated? I mean, not, like, probably not all of them, but a majority of them were that bad. Mm. So, like, because there, were, there weren't as much supervision and like, regulations as to how to treat patients, and a lot of them had no idea how to deal with mental health and, like, things like even autism and, like, hmm. 
like just like any intellect into why can't I say intellectual thank you <laughs> any of those kind of conditions that weren't like physical like physically seen mm. like they just assumed that they were just unruly and like didn't understand it so they couldn't really help them then they would do horrible treatments to them like that were actually kind of considered torture like waterboarding and ice baths uh -huh. lobotomies you know all that fun uh. stuff oh electroshock therapy shock therapy yeah electroshock therapy that's not terrifying. good not good. so that's kind of my inspiration for my story okay <laughs> it's not it's not good but this is a horror story that you're here for so yeah I tried to keep it as mild as possible because I was like, this is too upsetting to even write in, to even write about. So, yeah, just bear with me here, cause I didn't have time to write all of this out, like typing it. So you might hear some page turning, mm -hmm. and my notes are very messy. So I'll do my best. <laughs> I believe in you. Thank you. I had lots to do, so I didn't have a ton of time to type it out. When establishments close their doors for the final time, it's expected that these abandoned buildings will attract all kinds of visitors, from those experiencing homelessness to those who seek out an adventure of some kind. Now, when that abandoned property is an old asylum, you best bet that most of the trespassers will be under or around the age of 18. The Montgomery Asylum was no exception for this trend, and many who entered quickly discovered that it was already inhabited with its former patients and staff. Ben grew up as the youngest sibling, eavesdropping on his older brother and friend's gossip. A few times he heard them talking about the old asylum in a hushed tone and how they were planning on breaking in to explore and find ghosts just like their favorite ghost hunting TV show, Ghost Escapades. Is that real or no? No. I just looked <laughs> up a synonym for adventures. <laughs> I like that. That's funny. I love ghost adventures and all their silly drama. Some of his own classmates have been there and swear up and down that they saw a ghost with their own eyes, yet no one seems to have a photo or video of their experience to prove it. Some other classmates who have been there deny any sort of supernatural experience and say that the sounds they hear is the building itself falling apart. But regardless of the dangers of paranormal or physical threats, Ben was determined to find out for himself. His best friends Tommy and Megan wanted to join him and they spent most of their day on Saturday making a plan for their big adventure. They wanted to go to school on Monday and have proof that there were ghosts there, so they begged Ben's older brother Henry to join them. They mostly wanted to use his video camera, which they knew he'd never let them use on their own, and also he had already been to the asylum and knew all the ways in and out. The best time to go is at night, said Henry. The ghosts come out when it's dark. That doesn't sound like a good idea. Megan interjected. There's no way we can get away with using flashlights and not get caught. Then don't use them, smirked Henry. No, we'll fall into one of the holes in the floor if we're walking around blind, said Tommy. And it's so secluded, I doubt anyone would be strolling by to see us. I have infrared vision on my camera, added Henry. You'll be the only one holding the camera, said Ben. That's not fair. Henry chuckled. I'm only kidding. Mom and Dad would kill me if I let anything happen to you. Actually, if they knew where we were going, they'd kill both of us. Let's just go now. It's four o'clock and we still have a few hours of daylight left. Mm. This takes place in the summer, not right now. Because it's dark when it's four. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> sad. Ben, Tommy, and Megan piled into Henry's car, and the four of them headed to the abandoned hospital. Along the ride, Henry told them the history of the place and his own previous experience of breaking in with his own friends. He said, people used to just drop off their own family members here for any reason they could come up with. They didn't understand mental health yet. So if you were even slightly different than society's basic mold, or even if you were a woman having bad periods, or your husband just didn't want you anymore, you were driven over here and trapped for the rest of your life. Before there were cars, you could only get here by train, so no one would come here unexpectedly and see the unpleasant treatment of the patients. The car was quiet as the seventh graders thought that over. It felt like a sadistic joke that it didn't take much to be committed. Henry continued. As treatment for the common patient, they would try things like shock therapy, lobotomies, waterboarding, ice baths, and even experimental drugs to cure them. 
If anyone fought back, they were punished with injections to sedate them, or even removing their teeth if they were biters. Mm. But worst of all, this hospital believes in eugenics, meaning that if anyone who didn't fit the mold for the quote-unquote perfect human race, they would remove their reproductive organs so they couldn't breed. Oh my god. That, that was one of the things I forgot to mention earlier. That was one of the most upsetting things. Yeah. I don't remember if Penhurst did that specifically, but I know there are a lot of, like, mental hospitals that did that. Because they weren't perfect human beings, so they were like, you are not allowed to breed. Oh. Yeah. That's nasty. Yeah, it's pretty gross. I think that's upsetting enough yeah. to be oh, in a horror story. What the hell? Said Tommy from the back seat. He and Megan looked at each other uneasy. Yeah, people were awful back then. Henry went quiet for a moment, then added, But when me and my buddies went in, it was pretty cool. You definitely need to watch out for the holes in the floor, and parts of the ceiling crumbling down. But there are a bunch of rooms in each building worth looking at. In the dorm building, there are beds everywhere because they were so overcrowded that they had to house people in the hallways and lobby. Then my friend Brad said that he saw a shadow figure peek out from behind a doorway in the administrative building and then slink away back into the shadows. I didn't see it, though. He had gone off by himself, and he probably made it up. Wait, Justin from my math class said he saw that figure, too, said Megan. He said it was like eight feet tall and walked across the other end of the hallway towards the stairs. We have to catch that on video, said Ben. I also heard that in the dormitory's second floor, there's a lady who just cries all the time, and a little kid who likes to play with the toys people leave. Same. Same. <laughs> yeah, that sounds much safer than the creepy eight-foot-tall shadow figure, so I'm pumped to see that, said Tommy. Henry snorted. Suit yourself. They were driving down a long rural road that was surrounded with trees that made you feel like you were going through a tunnel. When they came out the other side, all three friends gasped as they saw the large administrative building looming over them as they parked and got out. Henry set up his camera and followed his brother and friends to the front door. The door is locked, Henry said as Ben reached for the handle. The easiest way in is around back through the window. They followed him around the corner and were disappointed to see that the window he stopped at was boarded up. Henry handed his camera to Tommy to hold as he pulled out the nails from the rotted window frame and placed the wood panel on the ground and leaning up against the building. Who wants to go first? Smiled Henry. I will. Ben came forward and Henry boosted him through the window and into the dark room inside. Next went Megan, then Tommy. Tommy handed them the camera and went in. Henry followed by climbing in himself and took the camera back. They were in an old office, so they didn't find anything too interesting when they rifled through the desk. However, they did find a filing cabinet that was already pried open, so they took a quick look at some of the patient files. This looks like it's for the children's ward, said Megan, softly. She started to tear up as she looked at their pictures in medical history. There wasn't even anything wrong with some of them. They were just abandoned here by their parents, or even born here. Hmm. The filing cabinet that Ben was looking through seemed to be the employee files. He flipped through the nurses, doctors, cafeteria workers, and stopped to stare at one of the janitors. His name was Bruce Nightingale, and he had a number of complaints filed against him, mostly by the female staff. An alarming number of these were unnecessary comments of women's appearance to physically abusive tactics to gain control over them. Ben looked into Bruce's crazed eyes and felt a shiver run down his spine. He put the file back where he found it and decided he was done looking through them. Then Tommy exclaimed, I found the doctor. Everyone hurried over to him to look at the file. Dr. J. Allister was the head physician here during its worst era. He quote-unquote treated patients with torture tactics to heal their mental illnesses. His favorite treatment was the lobotomy because they were always turned from having any kind of personality to a complete vegetable afterwards. He even bragged in a TV interview that at least they were no longer melancholy, as if feeling nothing was better than feeling depressed. Wait, what exactly is a lobotomy? It's when... Hmm, it's not fun. Okay. So the patient's laying on the table, and they're awake, and the doctor takes an ice pick, puts it in the corner of their eye. I'm pretty sure it's the corner closest to your nose. And then uses, like, a hammer. Oh, yeah, okay. I know. Yeah, yeah okay. Never mind. Because it, it 
goes into the front of your brain where your personality is. No! Yeah. No! So they're like, that's where the mental illness is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm not. You guys are here for a horror story. This yeah. is what you're getting. <laughs> also, quick note that Dr. Fear, the real one, he went on TV and bragged about it. So I kind of used that in his, um, in, as his character. Inside. Yeah, so Dr. Yeah. Alistair is kind of the Dr. Fear of this story. Okay, let's see. Uh, I left off with lobotomies. <laughs> Wasn't he also the one who drugged patients for fighting back against him, pulled out their teeth? asked Megan. Yeah, that's him, said Henry with disdain. That asshole is probably the root of most of the bad energy here. Disgusting man, mumbled Megan as they started to head towards the hallway. It was unsettling seeing things like wheelchairs left unattended and paperwork that was never finished left on the nurse's station. If it wasn't for the paint peeling off of the walls, the crumbling drywall, or the light fixtures hanging on by their wires, it would have felt like people just up and left yesterday. They unintentionally started to split up as they wandered around exploring. Ben found himself still walking down the hall as the others entered different offices. The end of the hall was dark. There weren't any windows to let in the sunlight, so when he noticed that the exit sign above the doorway to the staircase was glowing red, he paused in confusion. Because there's no power. Yeah. <laughs> I got that one again. <laughs> I'm like, see, if I edited this, I would have added something like that in. Yeah. Then something caught his eye. Something tall and darker than the shadows that peeked around the left corner, then disappeared. It's the dude. It's the dude. Before Ben can stop himself, he was walking toward the doorway and looked down the stairs leading to the basement. He saw the dark mass disappear around the corner, and again he followed. As he descended the steps, he felt the atmosphere shift and a heaviness weighing him down with each step he took. When he entered the basement, a tall man was standing in front of him. Ben recognized him as Bruce Nightingale from the file and felt a wave of fear wash over him as Bruce lunged for him. Mm. He tensed in anticipation, but let out a sigh of relief when he opened his eyes to find himself alone again. Ben looked around quickly for any sign of Bruce, but he was gone. He turned and ran back up the stairs to the ground floor, then froze when he saw people walking around in white coats, welcoming guests into their office. Ben walked to the nearest room with the door cracked open and listened. If I'm understanding you correctly, Mr. Jones, you are admitting your wife today? Yes, that's correct, responded Mr. Jones. All right, and what is her ailment that you are hoping we can correct here? Let's turn the page. <laughs> she is suffering from melancholy and hysteria. She wanders around the house at all hours of the day, just wailing and having fits. I do not know what else I can do for her at this point. I see, said the man behind the desk. It is unfortunate that so many women suffer from these ailments. I think that your wife will fit in here quite well. Ben kept walking down the hall to the front door, and along the way he couldn't believe some of the things he was seeing and hearing from others who were dropping their own family members off for admission. Children were clinging on to their mothers as they were torn away by a staff member, and those with disabilities were being escorted away and brought out the door to go to the dormitory building. He followed a few nurses who were bringing a young boy, possibly around 12 years old, to his new room. The boy cried as one of the nurses had a firm grip on his arm and scolded him as soon as they were out of earshot of his parents. "'You're going to have to toughen up,' she said through gritted teeth. "'You may have gotten away with acting up at home with your parents, but we have no tolerance for it here.' "'I didn't do anything,' the boy cried as she continued to drag him along. "'Well, for one thing, you're going to learn to listen and do what you're told.' Ben couldn't listen any more. It was one thing to read about how badly the patients were treated, but it was a totally different thing to see it unfolding before you. He tried to turn and head back, but his feet only continued to walk in the same direction as the nurses and the boy. He quickly realized that he had no control over his own body, which now that he was looking at it didn't seem to be his at all. Panic started to overwhelm Ben, but he couldn't cry or shout out for help. He was trapped here in this playback of a memory. Mm. That's crazy because I'm like, I'm kind of also picturing it in my mind as well, like as you're reading it. Yeah. And it's like freaking me out now. Oh, good. That's yeah. my goal. Yeah. 
If it's not scaring anyone else, my goal is to scare Brandy. Yeah, it's pretty easy. You can drive back in the dark. You're going to have to walk me out. <laughs> <laughs> he followed them to the dormitory building and could only watch as they shut the boy in a room. Ben headed to the second floor and opened a closet where he was bewildered to find a young girl, probably around Ben's own age, tied up and unconscious. He was horrified when he found himself taking a preloaded needle out of his own pocket and injecting the girl with the substance. Yeah. That part was the worst for me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? <laughs> Benny discarded the needle in a trash bag and grabbed the rest of the roll of bags to take the trash out around the building. He could hear the man's thoughts in his own head. I'll be back for you later. The scene then changed to nighttime. Everyone had gone to bed and the nurses had made their rounds for the hour. Ben watched himself move towards the closet again and open it to find the girl still inside, but slowly starting to come back into consciousness. Wait, so he is, like, the doctor right now? He is like, the janitor. In his mind? Okay. Yeah. That was Bruce. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Come on, a gruff voice said as he hoisted the girl up to her feet. She stumbled along next to him as she was led on down to the basement. Once down there, she was brought to the tunnels where Dr. Alistair was waiting with a metal slab from the morgue and operating tools. Mm. About time you showed up, Bruce, said Dr. Alistair. I had a few extra tasks I had to take care of tonight. One of the new boys wet the bed already and managed to get it all over the floor, too. Dr. Alistair grimaced. We could fix him next. Bruce hoisted the delirious girl onto the metal slab and made her lay down. Now what's the problem with this one? asked Dr. Alistair. She talks back to the staff and doesn't get along with the other children. Her parents brought her here as a means to rid themselves of social embarrassment. They won't come get her until she's a proper lady. That sounds like a personality illness in the frontal lobe and possibly encouraged by puberty hormones. I think our best bet is to give her a hysterectomy and a lobotomy to cure yeah. these ailments. Ben was forced to watch in horror as Dr. Alistair operated on the poor girl. She tried to fight back before they sedated her again, but Bruce was much stronger than her and held her down until she was out. He watched the pick go through her eye and watched as she was opened up and her uterus placed in a jar of formaldehyde. Ah. I hated myself yeah. doing that. <laughs> okay. She only woke up a few times in the most painful moments, but passed out from the pain and shock. By the time Dr. Alistair was done with his barbaric operation, the girl had passed away from blood loss. Ben wanted to cry and escape his vision, but he was trapped in Bruce's body. He was furious and wanted to hit Dr. Alistair when he realized that she was dead. Ah, well, another one gone. I really felt that she would have been cured if she survived. Bring her to the furnace and bring me that bedwetting boy tomorrow night. Bruce did as he was told in burning the girl's body and then went about his mourning as usual. However, as he was cleaning in the administrative building, a woman had come in and asked to pick up her daughter to visit home for Christmas. Unfortunately, they couldn't find her when they went to retrieve her, and they never would. Ben woke up on the floor of a bedroom in the dormitory building, to his friends and brother standing around him. Ben, are you okay? Megan asked, worried. We couldn't find you for like an hour, scolded Henry. Why did you go off on your own? Ben was at a loss for words. He held up his hands and felt his face to make sure they were his own and let out a sigh of relief when it was confirmed. What happened to you? Tommy asked concerned. Just as Ben was about to respond, he froze when he saw the girl who died standing behind Henry, with more and more people appearing behind her. She just looked at Ben with a sad, grateful smile, and he knew then that he needed to share their stories. Oh, wow. The end. Well, those people were the doctor's victims. Yeah. That wasn't clear. Yeah. Oh, sorry for depressing everybody. <laughs> but it's like, those things actually did happen. Like, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. And the tunnels were not a good place in a lot of those places, because that's where, like, a lot of the staff would do a lot of their physical abuse to people, and mm -hmm. sometimes they would escort the dead bodies out of there, so that way none of the other patients would see how many of them were actually dying. I don't get, like, how whoever brought these people in didn't notice that, like, so many people were dying just by bringing them in 
Unless they, that was the purpose of them bringing them in there to, like, just kind of kill them off. Well, it was kind of a hush-hush thing when people would die. Yeah. But, Excuse like, me. you brought your family member there. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they're dead. Well, they could have told them that they ran away and couldn't find them. Mm. Um, they could have told them that something was severely wrong with them and they passed away from it or something. Mm. Like, they definitely would cover a lot up. That's so sad. Yeah. Thankfully, a lot of mental hospitals nowadays are much better. Mm. Um, I haven't been to one personally, but from what I hear, they are, like, actually helpful. <laughs> people actually make it out. Yeah, people, yeah. People, like, can go there and actually, like, have some help mm. and, like, be able to live their lives afterwards. They have places like that, like, and again, this was, like, old school, like, turn of the century kind of treatment, and actually it's upsetting to hear that, like, a lot of them were closed in, like, as recently as, like, the 70s, or even, like, the, the 90s. The 70s? Yeah, I forget what? which one I heard. Like, obviously, like, they probably weren't awful the whole time. Yeah. I'm hoping. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah, but a lot of the places, like... I've heard of some, I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I've heard of some that closed in, like, the 90s. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was pretty bad. So now that everyone's depressed, are you going to depress them some more? Probably. <laughs> okay, so it is my turn. Yes. Scare me. Well, this one was, like, harder for me to write because I'm afraid. You're not a spooky person. I'm not a spooky person, but... Yeah. I definitely took a stab at it. And I'm proud of you for that. That's what that's what these prompts are for is to expand our horizons. Yeah. Unfortunately I've inserted I've inserted horror into like almost everything, mm -hmm. but I'm working on it guys. But I think next time when we get back to this genre, hopefully I'll have a better idea. Yeah. Okay. We can have a scary movie marathon sometime. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh mm -hmm. I actually forgot I just wanted to tell you something. Because mm -hmm. I actually um, tried to, because of Thanksgiving and, like, Christmas, it actually was kind of hard for me to get into the horror, like, mindset at first. Like, I actually did kind of struggle, too, but, like, I forgot to tell you that I tried to get into the mindset by watching scary movies. And yeah. so, like, Five Nights at Freddy's is on Peacock right now, even though it's in theaters. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I know you're not really supposed to watch, like, a stream movie if it's in theaters right now, but I really wanted to see it, and no one ever brings me to the movies, so... Um, and then they say they will, and then they don't. I'll take you to the movies. Just Everyone let me says know. that. Everyone says that. You just that. gotta let me know. Everyone says that, and then they go to see the exact movie that I wanted to see with them without <laughs> me every single time. So I don't believe you. You gotta prove it to me. You gotta call me but, and say, "Hey, I want to go to the movies." No, I gotta plan these things out. That's what. Never mind. I'm not, <laughs> I can't do it sporadically. Okay. But anyways, I mean, not sp not sporadically, what's the word? Spontaneously. Thank you. But, so yeah, I watched that, and it was good. It wasn't that scary. You'd probably actually like it. They had an interesting storyline to it, which I didn't expect. But then afterwards, I was like, I can stay awake a little bit longer. There's this other movie I've been wanting to see on there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Oh, how was that? <laughs> I couldn't finish it. That bad? It, like, it was, like, I knew it was going to be, like, a slasher yeah. kind of film, which I don't like those, but they made it specifically to be, like, a classic slasher. Like, the opening title is, like, like kind of, like, a cheesy horror movie, like, um, like, um, the, like the title with, like, blood dripping down or whatever, and then, like, that suspense music, you know is what I mean? Is it, like, the Scream kind of? I don't know. I, I don't remember. I, don't I haven't seen Scream in a long time. But it was, like... It was funny at first, and then the more I watched it, I was like, this is, like, disturbing. Like, that's why I shut it off, because yeah. it was disturbing. So, like, it starts off as, like, this little cartoon, like, um, like a, kind of like a, like a sketch cartoon, and it was, like, a little Christopher Robin meeting Pooh and Piglet and all yeah. of them. It, like, the narrator's got this, like, deep voice, and he goes, Christopher Robin wandered into the woods and met these um, mutated animals <laughs> that <laughs> they could talk. 
and he was feeding them, so they loved him, and they all became the best of friends or whatever. Like, I'm not saying it word for word, but yeah. then the guy was like, they were abominations. <laughs> like, <laughs> because there were animals that were talking, and they were, like, taller, like, could walk around like people, so he was like, they were abominations. And then he was best friends. And then it goes to adult Christopher Robin, and I'm not spoiling anything because I didn't finish it. Yeah. <clears throat> but, like, just in case you wanted to watch it, there's a heads up. So, like, adult Christopher Robin goes back with, like, it was either his fiance or wife, I don't, I don't remember which one. And he's like, I know they're here. I know, like, I remember. And she's just like, I believe you that you believe that they were real. <laughs> like, she didn't totally believe him. He's like, no, Pooh is my best friend. And then... They find Pooh's house, but he wasn't home, but they, like, can see something's wrong. Oh, yeah, in the cartoon, they ate Eeyore after after Christopher Robin left for college. Because he wasn't feeding them anymore, so oh. they were starving. I forgot that part. Oh, no. They, they, they started starving and becoming feral, and then they hated Christopher Robin for leaving them, so they vowed never to like humans again, and they were going to go and kill them or whatever, so... And it was like, <laughs> and so like when they find Pooh's house, you see Eeyore's gravestone. <gasps> <laughs> it was like, oh my god! It was like it was so ridiculous. But then like it got bad. Like, it got hard to watch when they started killing people because yeah. like Piglet strangled the wife, and then Christopher Robin's like Piglet, no. <laughs> <laughs> say that Christopher Robin was supposed to like technically have schizophrenia like yeah, that's like, like his mental health. over analyzing yeah it. yeah but then the other part that made me laugh a little bit in like a bad horror movie thing was when um there's a there's like a group of girls staying in a cabin by the hundred acre wood <laughs> it was like an airbnb and there was one girl out in the jacuzzi by herself taking selfies and then in one of the selfies you just see lumberjack poo in the background <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to tell you about that in the beginning, and I forgot, so I just wanted to tell you about That's that. Hilarious. And if you if you like watching people getting run over by cars, you can watch it. No. Or being put through a meat grinder. No. Um, but otherwise, I would definitely say trigger warning for gore. Yeah. Because that was... It was so bad. I had to shut it off before he ran her over. I couldn't do it. I was just like, I just watched someone else go through, like, a wood chipper. I can't watch this. Oh. Like, <laughs> it was bad. But I tried. And that got me into the spooky mood. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm so glad that helped you. Yeah, okay. All right. This Can't has 12% on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going okay. to do this before the iPad. I almost said breaks. Um, no. <laughs> Don't Dies. break it. Okay. Don't do that. I'm just kidding. I wake up to a blood-curdling scream from my three young children. I spring out of bed from a dead sleep and make it down the hallway, tripping over toy cars and puzzles. I swing open the door and see my youngest daughter standing over my oldest son with a chef knife from the kitchen. When I open the door, she turns her head slowly and says, Mommy, he needs to disappear now. <laughs> There's nothing behind her eyes. She looks like my daughter, but she's not my sweet little girl. My son screams, Get her away from me! I scoop her up and I pry the knife out of her hands. Do you ever have those moments where, like, you're listening, but you're not processing, and then suddenly halfway through the sentence, you're like, wait. Yeah. Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I just did. <laughs> like, I was listening to you, but I wasn't processing it right away, and then I hear knife, and he needs to just Okay. Yeah. Okay, good start, good start. Thank you. She begins to cry, saying that I'm scaring her, and asking why I have a knife in my hands. I look back at her and I see life back in her eyes. It's almost like she was possessed and then the spirit left her. I hold her in my arms and we both begin sobbing. Maybe she had night terrors. I put her back to bed and I hide anything sharp from the kitchen and living room. I scour the rooms to make sure there's nothing that she could get her hands on. The children go back to sleep but I couldn't go back to sleep. My mind kept going to the worst case scenarios. I stay up just in case something happens again. I sit up for a couple hours and I slowly drift off to sleep again. There were times where I saw a child in the corner staring at me. I blink and she's gone. Ugh. So I go back to sleep after. I think it's my mind tricking me. 
I sleep on the couch and she appears in the corner again. I sleep on the couch and she appears in the corner again and she's sitting with her head tilted to the side and her eyes are wide and you can only see the whites of her eyes. Oh, I thought you were going to go black eyed children with this for a second. Oh, no. Do you know what that is? No. I'll tell you. We're not sure what they are, actually. We're not sure if they're demons or aliens, but they oh. try to look like a child and want to come in because they need help or something, but their eyes are all black. And there's just something not right about them. Like, they'll, like, put ketchup on an apple or something, like, trying to act like a person. Oh! <laughs> like, yeah, like, I thought you were going that route for Not quite, because I didn't know what that was. But All white, swaying on... What was that part? Like, she... I sleep on the couch, and she appears in the corner again, and she's sitting with her head tilted to the side. Her eyes are wide, and you can only see the whites of her eyes. Oh, okay, okay. I close my eyes again, and I suddenly wake up, and now she's in the middle of the room staring at me. I close my eyes once more, and now she's hovering over me, just slowly breathing. Ew. <laughs> I don't care how cute your kid is. Get get a new one. Get a new one. Return her to the store. It reminds me of, like, the times, like, we would go and wake up mom, and then she's like, <gasps> every time we wake up. <laughs> Look at the sound wave after you did that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I think I got cut off a little bit. That's all right. That's funny. You were oh. slowly breathing. I accept my fate in thinking this is the night that I die. <laughs> She's. <laughs> I don't know why I said it like that, but... Well, it's funny because, like, keep it. this happens... I mean, not this specifically, but children, like, creep parents out all the time. I love it. Those are my favorite stories. She is going to be the one who's going to end my life. But I'm also thinking, it's just a dream. I'm going to wake up soon. Hopefully. I hear a crash and creaks from the kitchen. The kitchen is dark, and the only light that's on is over the oven. I see my daughter on a step stool standing over a boiling pot. She's about to dip her hand in it. I scream, no, Macy, you'll hurt yourself. She slowly turns her head 180 degrees. Ugh. And now she's looking at me while still trying to dip her hand in the pot. But mommy, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten in three days. I dart over and scoop her up and throw her in the car. I told Brian to watch the baby so I can take Macy to the hospital. I sped over to the local hospital. It's known for being the best in the county. The yes. other closest hospital is three hours away. We are on our way and she starts kicking the seat and screaming, Help! I'm being attacked and they're hurting me. Aww. They're hurting me. I can't see anything. Aww. She starts smashing her head off the side of the door. There's a pool of blood in the back seat. Oh, Now I'm screaming... Oh, Skipped a line. No, yeah, I decided. Oh, okay, I didn't want that. <laughs> I think I did that once or twice too. It's like, eh, that's too much. Sorry, continue. There's now a pool of blood in the back seat. Now I'm screaming louder, telling her to stop. She has scratch all over her body and a laceration on her head that's gushing blood. I whip into the parking spot and I carry her out of the car with her screaming, and now she's attacking me, biting and punching me. She keeps repeating, help me, mommy. They're in my brain. <laughs> that was weird. Oh, no. They're in my brain. <laughs> oh. Sorry. Well, it's sad because that's how a little kid yeah. would describe it, probably. Yeah. Help me, mommy. They're in my brain. They want me to hurt you and kill you. A swarm of doctors whisk her away with severity of her injuries. They start asking me questions. There's so many of them. I couldn't think, and I just broke down in tears. I promise I haven't laid a hand on her. She just started the strange behaviors tonight. It's like she's possessed. That's not my little girl in there. They brought her into the psych ward to have her evaluated. She gets strapped to her bed with no way to move. They say that she's a flight risk and a danger to herself and others. She Baby. starts thrashing around and a deep growl comes out of her. I call a priest to come in as well from our local church. She starts foaming from the mouth and seizes. The psychologist thinks it's more than a mental problem. Maybe she has something in her brain causing this. But the priest thinks it's spiritual. 
I told them to proceed with everything that they're going to do. Someone has to be incorrect. She spends the night in the hospital. I was allowed a cot in the room with her. Yeah. <laughs> I was allowed a cot in the room with her as long as she is secured to the bed. The whole night she is yelling at me trying to get out of the straps. The noises that she is making sound like a ravenous wolf trying to fight for their food. She is not my daughter. She just looks like her, but she's not mine. I want to leave, but I don't think I'll ever come back if I walk out these doors. I don't know if I can separate what I saw tonight from who she really is. She might be normal tomorrow, but I will never trust her ever again. But I will never trust her again. I can't have her around the other children. What if this happens again? My mind begins to fade into the light. My body begins to feel fuzzy. I'm coming out of a dream. I wake up in a white padded room with pillows over my hands. I look around and wonder where I am and I start freaking out and I yell for help. I hear over the intercom system, good morning, Macy. It was just a dream. You have the same one every single night. You're remembering your childhood. Your mom did abandon you in the hospital. Aww. You have two choices. You can come out into the common room and participate in the activities, or you can stay in here and ruin another day for yourself. Jeez, harsh. I say, so the children? That was me and my siblings? Yes, it was. Do you want to come out and we can work through what you've experienced? Maybe we can make more progress today. You came here when you were 10. You are now 13. Mm. What happened to me? Why don't you come out and we can do some one-on-one -on -one therapy today? Okay, we can do that. I walk out into a small room. It has coloring books and puzzles. So what happened to me? Why did my mom leave me? The doctor says, when you were about 10 years old, you started experiencing psychotic episodes, almost to the point where people thought you were possessed. You were hallucinating things and you tried to hurt yourself and other people around you. You had almost superhuman strength. You started having seizures off and on. So we did a brain scan and you have an inoper inoperable tumor in on the temporal lobe. Well, that was very sciencey of you. Yeah, I did some research. <laughs> But it's in the... I don't know if this part's going to make sense now. Okay, but, that's all right. But it's in the part of the brain that we cannot get to because it's way too deep. That makes sense. So that explains all the dangerous behavior and you can't feel pain. You were experiencing PTSD dreams where you were trying to work out what you did and your mom abandoning you in the process. Unfortunately, there is nothing we can do for you except for intense therapy. You are doing a lot better than you were, but some days are better than others. But today will be a good day for you. Dang. Did they ever get rid of the demon then? Because she was disappearing and reappearing in parts of the room? Well, it was... Or is that part of the dream? That was part of the dream. Okay. So What about the deep voice coming out of her? <laughs> it was kind of like... You know, like, how when people are going through, like, these episodes of, like, I think what I was trying to get at, like, it was a dream. Yeah. So that's why it was kind of twisty. Yeah. But in general, she did have a brain tumor, mm. but her dream was also making up. Oh, like, filling in the spaces. Yeah, filling trying in Trying to the rationalize spaces. it. Yeah. Like, it's not me, it's, I'm possessed. Yeah, exactly. Okay. that makes sense. Dang, you went on hard with that. Like, I, like, I don't know. Like, I didn't expect it to start off so strong. <laughs> I liked it. Yes. I tried. Like, I had, like, a little bit of a slow burn, and you were just like, everyone buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crashing the car tonight. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was good. Thanks. Yeah, even though we both kind of struggled with that, yeah. I think we did a good job. Tell us what you think in the comments. Yeah. Is it coconut time? Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, I'm trying to peek. Yeah, so this is the job. I remember, I remember that they have like little holes on the top for a straw so we can actually mm -hmm. look in them to like see what color is in there without opening them and re uh, having to reclose them. So, 
Do you want to pick the first one? Yeah. Yeah. I keep not speaking into this. I'm sorry. Okay. For next week, our genre will be... <laughs> it's one that we've already done. I'm picking another one because I want to... Oh, wait. I have two in my hand. Pick one. Okay. <laughs> what? Complete 180 from this week. A children's story. Oh, yay! That's exciting. <laughs> it is supposed to entertain children under the age of 12. <laughs> so the next one will be child-friendly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put an explicit one yeah, on this I was going to say, this is not child-friendly. I can't, like, decide sometimes whether to put explicit on some of them because I'm like, is this scary? Because I'm kind of numb to scary stories. Oh. And I'm like... You have to be the one to put that? Yes. Oh. I yeah, so that. I think a couple of them I did it, and then afterwards I was like, I don't think that was necessary. Yeah. But this one I'm going to do it for because it is kind of disturbing. Yeah. Put a trigger warning on yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So our setting. I think That's the setting. Okay. One. Yeah, it's green. <laughs> our setting. Outer space. Ah, oh, children's story in outer space. That one I can do, because I'm always thinking about space. Okay, and our challenge will be... A mask. Oh, is it literally or figuratively? It's just... Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, let's do a bit... Mm, I guess you can decide both. It can be whatever you want. Child appropriate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so next week, our short stories will be a children's story in outer space, and we have to include a mask. Sounds good to me. Yeah, that'll be fun. I think I needed a mental break from the spookiness. Yeah, me too. Especially with Christmas coming up. Like, that's all. Like, I'm in like a manic happy mode right now. <laughs> like, I got to wear a Christmas sweater today. Because my friend's baby shower was today, and it was themed Santa Baby because her due date is Christmas. Oh, <laughs> I love that! Yeah, so I got to wear my Christmas, my only Christmas sweater today. It says Merry Catmas on it, and there's a little black cat mm -hmm, on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Yes. We hope you are scared out of your mind, and you have a nightmare tonight. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Send in your short stories and or ideas for us for the regular episodes at a pod of tales at gmail.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at a pod of tales. And you can listen to us on <laughs> Spotify and YouTube. Yeah, at a pod of tales. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we hope you have a wonderful week. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for letting us take a week off, even though we didn't really give you a choice. Yeah. Goodbye. Okay, bye. Bye.